quite passionate. I mean, I know it sounds like a dramatic way to start a podcast, but it's just my truth. I'm quite passionate about healing yourself from the inside out in order to transform your business. Mm. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, we coming in real hot. We are. We're coming in hot today because I'm going to admit that I'm getting a little extra vulnerable because today my guest is my former therapist. Yeah, that's where you hear like tires screeching in the distance. (laughs) My former therapist is named Mark Harriton, and he has over 15 years of experience working in the field of counseling. So he had a life-threatening car accident, and then it gave him a firsthand experience in overcoming trauma, and then it motivated him to live his life in the moment. And you're like, okay, but what does that have to do with business? Okay, you're about to find out. In this conversation, Mark and I discuss why high-performing entrepreneurs need therapy to up-level their life and business and how you can find the right therapist or get help. And you're like, no, 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 this is not the podcast for me. How about you have an open mind to know or to learn what you might need to know or learn about up-leveling your business and your life? And I have to let you know that this conversation, it really exposed and showed a new part of me that I actually like sharing with you. So I loved chatting with him again. And no matter what your experience is with, with personal development, even if it's not your cup of tea, even if like a, in a bookstore, you're like, that's the self-help section. We don't look at that. No, no, no. We're having a conversation, y'all. I know that you're going to gain so much clarity from his insights. So let's listen in. Well, Mark Howerton, welcome to the Jasmine Star Show. I have to tell you that uh, I think this has been years in the making. We just didn't know it. We didn't know it, but it has been years in the making. I'm so happy you're here. And I know that there are listeners who are just like, wait a minute, Jasmine, are you actually bringing your former therapist to talk? And I'm like, oh, oh, I am. Oh, I am. I love getting uncomfortable. I love opening up my story uh, to help others. I won't get into specifics unless it leads down that pathway. Like I mentioned to Mark, I do have notes for the show, but every time our conversations just go the way that they are intended to go. So I am happy that we have connected over the years, but can you give us a brief overview of who you are, like what you focus on and uh, set the, set the framework for this conversation? Yeah. First of all, yeah, I just am so happy to be here. Like, it's really an honor. And, you know, I guess, I guess by law, I have to ask, are you comfortable re- revealing the, the ethical or releasing the ethical <laughs> standard of confidentiality? Uh, so I get that, you know, cleared out of the book so I don't get some... Uh, as, a, as a law school dropout, I'm so proud of you for asking. I mean, yes, 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 yes. I am, I am, I'm, I've been very open with my journey. I have talked about things and um, yeah, let's go there. Let's get a little bit, you can hear it in my voice. I'm like, ah. <laughs> Because up until this point, up until this point, my line has been: I can either confirm or deny that I know Jasmine Star. But now I, I know Jasmine Star. I'm going to shout it from the rooftop. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm a therapist in private practice in Orange County, uh, and although my office is here in Orange County, I've got clients all over the place. In fact, I had a couple session in Hong Kong just recently through uh, the, the wonderful power of Zoom. Uh, but yeah, I've got clients all over the country, and uh, and, and I work with individuals and couples. Um, predominantly from a therapeutic approach, but my style and sort of the the, the psychology and the and the approach that I, I come to my work with is very uh, coach minded. Mm-hmm. I'm very much kind of a dynamic. Like, let's get into it. Let's talk about you know both your thoughts and your actions, as well as sort of the deeper psychological dynamics of who we are, where we kind of come from, and how that motivates and influences our our lives and our work in the here and now. Mm. So one of the things that Mark just said was motivates and influences. And I think that's probably why Mark and I worked together for, I think it was over two years. So we we kind of went through this journey together, um, or actually you coached me, I should say, through the journey for two years. So he saw a lot of different phases of where I was. And I feel like that was one of the things, it was about taking action. And sometimes uh, taking an action is actually in action. I would sometimes leave appointments. I'm like, okay, Mark, so what's my to-do list? <laughs> and you're like, eh, therapy doesn't really work like that. Uh, so I'm just happy that you're here and you are a huge proponent of high performing entrepreneurs. And that's kind of where you and I focus. So I'm not going to talk about anything else other than part of the reason I went to therapy 
to begin with was it was as in relation to how I was feeling as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a creative. I would kind of work through a lot of things. So I, I kind of want to start first. So somebody who's here and maybe they've tested therapy or haven't gone to therapy or avid therapy proponents, like why do you think it's important for business owners to invest in therapy as part of their business growth? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, so ironic, just literally my client that just left my office just before we jumped on this call is a business owner, successful business here in Orange County. And, and uh, at the end of session, I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to jump on a podcast now and, and have a conversation in terms of, of therapy and business ownership. And I just said, I'll ask you, like, why as a business owner did you come to therapy? And he gave this great answer and gave me permission to say it. He said, he said basically, there's no sword that is more worthy to sharpen than my own. And as I am a better person, as I'm a sharper tool, then I'll be that much more of a better leader. And so just love that notion of, of for me, working with high achieving individuals, intelligent individuals, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, just knowing that to, to truly expand your impact, be the very best version of yourself, be the very best person that you can be. And that will broaden and expand how significant and, or, and, and successful you mm. are in your business venture. Yes. And amen. I mean, that right there, if that is not, if we are not here, ladies and gentlemen, listening and feeling worthy enough to sharpen our sword, I hope by the end of this conversation, Mark has really um, at least inspired you to o- to open your mind and consider it. So uh, the first time I ever went to therapy, it was with you, Dr. Mark, and it was very foreign. And I think that I don't want to make a broad statement in regards to certain cultures are more leery of therapy. But all I can say from my experience was that my I have a twin sister. My twin sister and I were the first in any generation at all to go through therapy. Why do you think it's a little stigmatized or why do you think people are skeptical of the idea of therapy even today even today when i like i'm talking with my team i didn't say that like oh hey guys i got a new therapist but i had mentioned oh hey in therapy i spoke about this and it kind of like a little bit of like a, a fissure kind of like a huh she must have something really serious going on and i'm like whoa, whoa, whoa wait no we go to therapy to not go through the spiral so why do you think there's so much of a stigma specifically us not talking about it in context of like what we create as business owners yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it's such a, a bummer. And I, I'm glad there has been a shift. And I'm hopeful even with, with specifically this generation and, and COVID and post-COVID, there's just more of a realization that, that one, we don't need to pretend that we don't have challenges. And so mm-hmm. whether that is a legitimate diagnosable anxiety disorder or depression or substance struggle or, or, or you know, significant challenge in a relationship, we don't need a pretense. There's no need for sort of this false personification. It's hopefully more acceptable uh, to come get therapy. But I also think that there are some individuals, especially who are kind of in the high achieving, like highly motivated, like driven you know, set, who are nervous that they might lose their edge. And I've had this conversation a lot with, with folks who are, again, just, just in this caliber of, of lifestyle where they're fearful to come to therapy because they think, well, I don't really want to you know, go sit on a couch and explore my deep unconscious mind and, and then be less motivated to work. Because right now I'm driven and you know, I'm getting up early in the morning and I'm doing my thing. And if I get fixed... Maybe I'll lose that edge. I feel like you're calling me out. I feel like you're, I I feel like you're trying to be like very judicious and like, oh, I'm not going to say this is what Jasmine was feeling when she came in. (laughs) When I've worked with business owners in the past, is that, (laughs) you know, like quote unquote air quotes. While I wouldn't necessarily say I was worried about losing an edge, it was disguised differently. But the under, the, the kernel of truth was that I was concerned that if I changed my behavior and the behavior of constant beating myself up and just quite honestly self-hate is I thought that the self-hate was actually the thing that was pushing and motivating me that me talking to myself so negatively it's like you're behind you're not going to get caught up you're not working hard enough you need to work harder like I felt like that was my secret sauce and it took years of undoing and you challenging those beliefs so if it, it would be if nothing else us talking about what that looks like and how we move away from that. But before we get there, you have like hundreds and hundreds of patients. And so I'm not going to be offended if you don't remember the first time we met. Do you have any recollection? Maybe not the first time, but like that first kind of like entry point of us getting to know each other. Like what were from some first 
initial reactions, perhaps, so that people can identify or not identify. I always believe that vulnerability and us being open, like Brene Brown talks about, we can share things from um, a scar, not a wound. So it is healed. So I can talk about things that I, for years, couldn't talk about. So I come in and I meet you. Anything from that beginning, because there is a story that I have from that, but anything that you remember from our early conversations? Well, I, I, I do remember early conversations with, with us when we first started working together. Um, and mind you, you know, in, in some ways, even think back, where were you 10 years ago compared to where you are now as far as the, the building blocks that you've had in your career, in your business? And so it, for me, it was very quick and easy to really kind of start drilling down on what are those high value for me, key motivators, our, our primal or our primitive motivators. Um, so, you know, I don't know, maybe just generically, I remember getting into that. What is your story? Understanding your background, your family, your family's origin story, as far as how you got to where you are now, um, the, uh, you know, go, going through school, deciding not to do law school, mm-hmm. kind of having those early conversational shifts. I, and I, I have to tell you this, I, you this, I even as we're saying this, the, the internal ethics professor in my brain is saying, careful, Mark, careful, Mark, you're speaking about a former client. So I don't know, maybe you should tell the story and I'll, uh, I'll follow no, your no, lead. That, there was multiple stories. There's multiple stories. But one thing that like Mark just gave us like an overarching framework that a lot of people won't get through the framework because they don't understand how it impacts our behaviors today. So when he talks about our origin stories, where our families are from, how you were raised, we spent months just going through how I was raised. And I would just, I actually hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Not because I felt like I didn't love talking about my family because I did. I love talking about my origin story. I think it's pretty cool that like immigrant families doing great things in America. I love that story. But I was like, I just didn't get why we were talking about me as a child, like those impactful events. And I was just like, why, why, why? Why? And then all of a sudden, after doing the work, I started realizing that those things shaped my view of the world currently. And I had to undo the childlike perspective that then became truth with a capital T in my life when I realized it actually wasn't true. But there is this one time early in our therapist patient relationship is I had sent you a Christmas card and I had sent you a Christmas card and we had been working together maybe a couple months by this point in time. And at my next session, we sit down and we're having small talk. And then you just come out and you're like, why did you send me a Christmas card? And I was like, bro, I send Christmas cards. And then you asked, was it for any other reason? Did you want to be noticed or different than any of my other patients? And I was like, no. And that question has stuck with me. Wow. For almost a decade. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, obviously I send Christmas cards to people I love and care about like, woohoo. But that question in relation to my relationship with my therapist, who I'd been working with just for a couple months, mm-hmm. it like, it irked me because there was something true about it. I'm an Enneagram three and I want people to like me. And I go out of my way to personalize relationships quickly. I go out of my way to like, how can I offer value? Cause that's become defining of my worth. And Mark, I was like, that was probably a big turning point for me. I was like, fine, I'll talk about my inner child for however long, because this man's going to like undo this little puzzle piece. So for business owners who obviously maybe you don't have access to a therapist, and we're going to get to a little bit of that in the end, but it would behoove us to enter this conversation right now. I actually just brought Mark on because I wanted a free therapy session (laughs) um, and then have other people listen to it. No, but it would be really important for us to be open to the idea that what we believe now has been shaped by who we were and impacts the decisions we make now. And not everything and not how we see the world is exactly as we see it. So we're going to be open to looking at this just in this conversation. Just give yourself this open to seeing something a different way. So I'm going to ask, what are some of the common themes? Now you're not going to talk about your patients, but what are common themes that you I love that story of the Christmas card when you sent me a Christmas card. I know. Okay. So you loved it. Oh, I didn't give you a chance to respond. Yeah. Let me, yeah. I was just glazing over it, Mark. Cause I was like, uh, I feel vulnerable and open. Let's move on. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was so wonderful. And, and again, this goes back to, uh, again, I think why people uh, are hesitant to come into therapy because literally the two things that came of it, one is you, you, you know, it was very apparent that you're always working very, very hard and wanting to perform well and wanting to win people over. 
And I literally remember sitting here, Jasmine, and saying, wait, do you think you have to win your therapist over? Like mm -hmm. we are by law in the confidentiality of this room. Mm -hmm. By law, I cannot say anything that I know you or that, you know, anything about our conversations until you've just given me permission to do so. <laughs> and, and you paid me. You paid me for that session. And yet there was still this sense of, I want to perform well in therapy. And so, and, and, you know, there was so much of, of, I'll say generically early work and our early work that I literally had to say, this has to be a place. You have to have a place and your listeners have to have a place where they can just be raw. They're not on, they're not performing, they're not producing. And like you said, there were so many times you're like, Mark, what's my homework? Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And, and certainly there was times that you had homework and I wanted to right. give clients homework. Right. But a huge part of the homework is you have to realize that the only success in this therapeutic relationship and your growth is just being and just being still and sitting in sort of that angst of what we speak about and, and diving into that more vulnerable side that's so easily covered up with action. Because as soon as I feel unsettled, I just do. And you're very, you know, some individuals are very accomplished at doing very, very well in a lot of things. And you have that skill set. And I'm sure your listeners do too. And so to force you and pull the reins back to say, just sit, just listen, don't perform, don't try to do therapy the right way. Just be in it and see what happens. Mark, I wanted to be the Valley Victorian of therapy. Like I, I just wanted to show up and I wanted to be like, this is my vaudeville show. Watch me be the best patient there ever was. And I think at that time, and I feel like I've made progress, but it's still always an undercurrent. I, I think that I like doing and I like executing because being still makes me look inward and hear myself and hear my thoughts. And I was just like, I don't, I don't like that. I would rather do because it keeps me preoccupied. So to come into your office, which was very much like a cocoon. I mean, you have mood lighting, bro. You have mood lighting for days. I mean, <laughs> the lights are low, like soft yellow lighting, a big comfy couch. You're sitting across from me in like a very nice ergonomic chair. You know, your tissues are out. I didn't like the sensation of just being me, quiet, raw, open, and then just having to sit. And I think that was one of the biggest takeaways. That was the first time in my life, like, gosh, Mark, like I was probably in like my early thirties when I started hanging out with you. You were or, a child. Oh, I mean, well, come on, Mark. I'm not that old, bro. It was like, come on, uh, come on now. It's a decade ago for sure. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, was it a decade ago? I no. think so. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was like 2014. Okay. Math is no. hard for me. That's why I'm a therapist. And okay, exactly. Leave the numbers to me. Leave the numbers to me. Uh, yeah, it's 2014, 2015. Okay, okay, so the act of, if you're noticing that you're doing things as an entrepreneur to stay busy so you don't think and you don't feel, I'm very logical. The feeling part of me, I am a twin, and I always joke that my sister got 100% of the feelings and I got 100% of the logic. Being forced to feel and talk about your feelings was such a new thing for me. And uh, Mark, help me do that. And speaking of helping people do that, you do that a lot with your entrepreneurial high-performing clients. Now, I don't want to talk too much about specifics of these clients, but like, are there any patterns that you see when it comes to, these are the common struggles so that people maybe feel like less alone in their struggle? Well, yes, yes. And a part of it, you've just uh, mentioned it, where there's this, this running engine inside of you and this feeling of, I've got to do, I've got to do, I've got to do. And so the, the reason I think it's so imperative that, that you came to therapy and that, you're, that your high achieving listeners come to therapy is because that, the part of our brain that is driving that engine is not our best part of our brain. That is, is under this, this you know, kind of back of our brain. So we all have a brain stem. Every mammal has the basic same brain stem that has our, our limbic system, uh, kind of the, the, the basic automatic functionings of our brain. And our fight or flight you know, component of the brain is in the back stem of the brain that every mammal essentially has. We alone have this prefrontal cortex in the front of our brain that gives us the ability to be strategic and problem solve and creative and be our very best human intellectual selves. The problem is our fight or flight mechanism is activated under what's called perceived threat. So if a tiger jumps in this room, boom, that, that automatic limbic system is on fire and I am fighting or flying. The difficulty is it's a dumb part of our brain. So it doesn't know the difference between literally a tiger jumping in the room and a bunch of e emails in our inbox mm -hmm. or negative self-talk that says, I'm not enough. I better do better. 
I better be better. I better perform. That is registering in the back part of our brain as threat. Therefore, you are elevated in fight or flight mode. And because you're a doer, you elevate fight. Another person by whatever nature who may not be as much of an activator by personality type will go into flight or freeze, which kind of disassociative. And very literally, we can flip a coin of, of looking at your high achieving audience and looking at maybe down and out addicted audience. And, and it's the same basic switch that got flipped. And some people fight and you fight like hell. And some people freeze or fly and they fly into distraction of substance abuse or, you know, whatever other mechanism gets them out of that scary place. So the reason that's so important is because when we work through it and move away from perceived threat to actually desire for ambition and making a difference in the world and have positive motivators, yep. we are actually opening up the most creative parts of our brain. Because you're smart enough, you, you fight well. And just like the fastest gazelle yep. stays alive because of the fastest. Yep. And so all your hardworking, driven, high achieving friends and listeners have succeeded because they're just the fastest gazelles, but they're still operating as a gazelle mm. and we are not gazelles. And so when we can pause, give ourselves the ability to even hear that voice and become friends with it, essentially, yep. it's okay to say, I realize that there's a little girl, a little boy inside of me that wants to say, I'm enough. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. I'm pretty enough. I'm talented enough. I'm handsome enough. I'm strong enough. If we accept and embrace that little part of us, then we don't have to fight or fly. We can be, be still and, and activate our most creative parts of our brain, which is, again, in, in the school of, of humanistic psychology, we can move to self-actualization, which means truly, like literally elevate our, our consciousness beyond just, am I making you know, the bottom line or am I making my numbers or am I you know, achieving whatever status I've achieved? and surviving in the savanna or making the number or making the sale. Instead, I'm existing in a plane that's providing happiness, deep, rich satisfaction, and frankly, unlimited success. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. We can just end the podcast. I mean, <laughs> I'm done. So there was a, a couple things there. It's the flight, fright, or freeze. None of them are better than the other, and none of them are worse. They're, they're equally detrimental. I'm by nature hardwired as like a thug. I fight. I fight, Mark. And everything that led me into your office was on the back of fighting. And I felt, and I firmly believed that everything I had up until that point was because I fought tooth and nail for it. But what I didn't realize then, and it was in the process of working with each other, is that in order to fight, you must have an opponent. Mm. And in my fighting ring, the only other opponent was me. And so I was constantly beating myself up and then you started challenging me to act and behave and think and change my behavior to live in a place of abundance. abundance. And instead of looking for what I was not doing, looking instead for what I wanted and then ma mapping my actions to that. So I was dealing in that small part of the brain, the reptilian part, and I wasn't dwelling in the power of the pre frontal cortex that you had just mentioned. This is a space of creativity. This is strategy. This is planning. And I felt that the way that my muscle, the way that you challenged my muscle to flex, I essentially over the years got so much more in shape. So somebody's sitting here right now and they're like, okay, fine, kind of, sort of, I'm not really sure if I buy into this. How does, how do people know if they're, if they should be in therapy? Are there like key signs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, um, I would, I would pretty much go all in on a bet that all of your listeners have some connection with that nagging negative inner voice. Amen. Uh, th there's a great book called, uh, it's actually a, this little coaching book called the high achievers guide to happiness a guy named Vance Caesar, what a great name, wrote this, this little book. And, and he says, there's three components that, of high achieving individuals, high level of confidence, where they believe they can do it, high level of competence, they can actually learn and adapt and do a lot of things. And then number three is a core insecurity, some pain yeah. or some woundedness or some negative nagging voice that is driving them. And again, that's why many people are nervous to go to therapy because they fear if I silence that voice, I'll lose my drive. And, and ultimately I'd say, I, I think right now, if all of your listeners are being honest, they have an awareness of what that is. Mm. 
where do you think that fear comes from? Like, so wh- those three things, competence, confidence, and an inner voice of fear. Where, what are the common places? Like, where's the root? Is there a pattern? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, there, there's, a, there's an interesting book called Lincoln on Leadership. And in the introduction to that book, uh, the author describes Abraham Lincoln, Bill Clinton, and um, Adolf Hitler all having the same basic family dynamic as far as a distant, or cold, or absent father and this overmeshed dynamic with their mother. I bring that up to say we go back very Freudian and say there's early indicators in our nurture side of life that, that would be key indicators of, of either disruption that lead the one of two ways, to driving compulsively to succeed and prove you're, you're, you're good enough, or blowing your life up and proving that you are in fact bad. And that's Ooh. what we see, a self-sabotage dynamic. So, so there's early formative uh, aspects of who we are. Again, I also believe by nature, we, we come out the womb ready to do. So, you know, for the most part, unless there's some major disruption, we are wired to thrive. So, mm-hmm. so nature uh, happens, we're born wanting to do well. And then nurture is what really can kind of like switch the gears on. Is this going to be just a normal cruise control or are we going to go into hyperspace or are we going to go down into the dumps? Mm. So, okay. A little bit of like clarity here. I've always believed that like, the chip on my shoulder is a good thing. Do I hear you say it's not so good? Like there's something to prove. I felt like like shots fired. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> I feel, uh, no, no, no. In like, in like a good way. Like I need to have a moment of reckoning. Like do I have some, I mean, I actually, I know I have something to prove. And is mm-hmm. that not a good thing? Or how do I reframe it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so let's pretend somehow through technology, we can communicate with ants. And we go down into this anthill and we interview some ants and we're able to talk to these ants and we identify the high performing ants. And, and we find, in fact, the best ant, the number one ant, the strongest ant, the smartest ant, the most successful ant, the most, the wealthiest ant. And, and we, you know, talk to him about being an ant and we say, thank you for sharing. And you and I walk away and say, that was just an ant. It was just a kooky ant. So it doesn't matter that we think we're this like, you know, phenomenal, like driven, like best thing ever. At the end of the day, I think we're all just ants. And so if we look at it in perspective of how can we make it into a game? How can we have fun with it? How can we realize this isn't my self-worth? This isn't my survival. We are not gazelles on the savannah running from a lion. We are sitting here in very comfortable rooms, looking at technology, using technology with money in our bank accounts, very fortunate, very, very privileged. And so the notion that we're thinking we're at a survival level is just ant thinking. At this point, what I want you to think about that competitive edge, not chip on your shoulder, competitive edge is is being a, a dynamic athlete. You know, I love watching sporting events and, and March Madness is coming up. I love me some college basketball and some March Madness. And and, you know, watching these intense, you know, championship games and seeing athletes, you know, tears in their eyes at the end of a game, if they lose, you know, there's a party who's like, dude, it's just a game, but yet they compel themselves. They work so hard. They're so competitive to enjoy the, 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 the pleasures of victory and the pains of defeat. So what I would say for you is chip on your shoulder, competitive edge, driven, whatever, let's shift from it coming from a place of deficiency or having to prove your self-worth to saying, I freaking love this game. This is a really fun game. And I'm good at this game. And I enjoy playing this game. And, and it's, a, it's a radical game that I play with my friends. And I play against some compo- uh, opponents. And sometimes those opponents are in my own head. And sometimes they're people in my community. But nonetheless, I'm viewing it from a sense of this is fun. Let's mm-hmm. lean into it and work really hard. And sometimes we're going to have tears when we lose, just like those athletes. Mm-hmm. But we're able to pull back enough to say, how privileged am I that I get to play this game? Play the game. Play the game. Dang it. Ah, okay. So one of the things that you had mentioned was the disassociation of our worth to what we do. And I, that was like a big turning point for me when we were working together was I was tied so closely to what I did. And what are, uh, I, and I, I can speak, a lot of business owners feel that way. A lot of times when I speak to the psychology of sales is that when somebody says no to your offer, you feel like it's a personal front. And for years, I felt the same way until I started disassociating myself from the offer. What are common ways for us to become number one aware, but how do we become disassociated from the thing that we do from the person we are? 
Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's funny. I just yesterday I had a client, a video client who's up in LA, an actor and um, fairly successful, uh, but still the place of auditioning. And, and we had to kind of deconstruct his experience in terms of similar to the sale and closing the sale to say, what is the percentage of auditions that any actor succeeds in? And how do we define that? And so, you know, even like, even the, you know, again, people who are auditioning, not offer only performers, but the people who are auditioning still like maybe a 10% return, you know, maybe 10 out of a hundred auditions, you get the part. And so we said, we're going to have to redefine the definition of success. And, and again, this is easy to do because the individual is competent and skilled and well-trained and, and, you know, successful enough to be able to say, okay, knowing full well, there's a, you know, nine, nine out of t- uh, 10 chance you're not going to get this, only a one in 10 chance you're going to get this. Like, let's think, what is the definition of success? How will you successfully win that audition? And certainly, you know, win the lottery and get the part, but most importantly, that you know, you won the room, that you crushed that audition. Mm-hmm. And so that when you and I check in in our next session, you're able to say, I nailed X number of auditions. I crushed it. I crushed it. Maybe got the part, maybe didn't. Then it's a sales numbers game. At the end of the day, eventually when you make enough calls, you're going to you know, close enough sales. But knowing full well that every call you make, every audition you go into, you are hell bent on crushing it. And so realizing and giving yourself kudos, I succeeded because my tone of voice the way I carried my body, the way I interacted in the room. Those were the elevations of success. Jasmine, it was with you that I coined this phrase, the subjective nature of success. Do you remember that conversation? Remember we talked about that from time to time. So that came up with you. you know, that's why I think you know, all those years ago to where I think it's very important. Again, I'm an existentialist. So way back in high school when I was reading Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson and all these you know, existentialists, I was like, okay, yeah, life is pretty crazy. And then when I watched the matrix, whatever in 2000, I'm like, Oh yeah, we live in the matrix. It's all the matrix. It's all a game. It's all an anthill, you know? And that's why I have these crazy ideas about anthills and these sort of things. <laughs> because it's, it's all the matrix. We're just in the matrix, baby. So therefore, how do we enjoy the ride and, and coming up in our conversation with you? And I'm sure we were talking about specifics, you know, do I do this? How do I do this? How do I, you know, get this? I'm like, I'm like, what if we're able to sit here and, and, and see ourselves at 90 or 100 years old and look back at this version of ourselves and realize that success is a foregone conclusion? Mm-hmm. I will be a successful person. I am a successful person. You are a successful person. You will be a successful person. That is a foregone conclusion. So then when you look back on this version of yourself today, what would you say? How would you say, knowing full well that you're on this trajectory of success? Again, and I wouldn't say this to someone who is not motivated, who's not working hard, but you're high achieving, high intelligent, high driven, high ambitious people who are working very hard. The listeners that are here right now, I guarantee you they work very hard. Mm -hmm. Nobody is successful, you know, Mm -hmm. with the notion of winning the lottery or rich uncle. Like Jasmine, I can recall you categorically are one of the hardest working people I know as we, you and I dissected your daily life. And I remember going through literally hour by hour and hearing your early start, your early routine. I remember thinking Jasmine works her ass off. Mm -hmm. And so to see the success that you're at and the trajectory of your success, that's a key phrase here. What is the trajectory of my success? It is a foregone conclusion that you are and will continue to be successful regardless of what number you've ascribed to that. Whether it's, hey, I made 100,000 or a million or 100 million, I don't care. You're on a trajectory of success. So therefore, how can you enjoy the ride? Mm-hmm. How can you give yourself that sense of, yes, I'm working hard. I'm exhausted. I'm sweating. I'm burning the candle at both ends. I'm maybe even sacrificing time with my family. I'm sacrificing time in my relationship. My body is taking a toll, but I know that I'm on the right path. I'm doing this. Can I derive some satisfaction in the process? How can I make this more fun? How can I celebrate the hard work that I'm doing today, knowing that I won today, even if the door was shut on my face, Mm -hmm. even if they hung up the phone, even if I didn't close the deal, I won today because I kicked ass in my subjective scale and my subjective definition of success today. Mm. I'm just leaving silence there because that like, that has to settle. That has to like deeply, deeply settle And one of the biggest takeaways and something I say, goodness, maybe daily 
and I didn't understand it the first 100 times you said it to me, but you said it here on the podcast, which is very true, Mark Howerton style. Your success is a foregone conclusion. And if somebody needs to hear that 100 times over, just replay this, this portion of the podcast. It basically means it is done. Foregone conclusion. That every time I walked into the office, like Mark held space for me when I didn't believe. And so we would be discussing, how do I show up? How do I take care of myself as I go into like a, a large like launch or a big promotion or a big project? And everything went back to, sure, attribute a, a dollar sign to success. But that's just one metric of many. How, how would I define success? And we had to work through what those means. There's so many layers of success that even if I didn't say hit that monetary goal, all the other indicators of success would prove that this was a success outside of just monetary. Your success is a foregone conclusion and the journey, the joy, the fun, the adventure should not be missed for only the end result. And Mark, that's where I was all the time. Like, let me just get to the end. And the irony that Mark highlighted strongly for me was when I got to the end of a project launch promotion, a highlight, the day that it was ending, I was already on to the next thing physically. I mean, I literally mean this like quite literally. We are the end of a promotion and I'm like already planning the next thing. And Mark had to say, whoa, you're not leaving any space to reflect, to enjoy, to talk about the learnings, the lessons. And, you know, my husband enjoyed me going to therapy because he's just like, listen to that Mark guy. Like he's been trying to, he's been trying to tell me that forever, forever. So he would gladly be like, girl, go to therapy more often. So these takeaways for business owners who are listening is that what is your metric, your metrics for success and reminding yourself that it is a game. And we are privileged. It is a luxury to play it. Our objective is to keep playing the game as long as possible and invite others by sharing what we know into playing the game. Because more people play the game, the better it gets. Okay, so uh, we talked about therapy and how does somebody go about right now? In, in light of the, I mean, there there's very little silver lining to COVID and the pandemic. But one of them that I've noticed, and I'm not even in the field, but I've noticed that a lot more people are talking about therapy and maybe mental health in, in a different way, um, specifically virtually. Like, how do you recommend somebody find a therapist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I do agree. That, that is definitely a silver lining. And, and just I've been doing video sessions and Skype sessions for years, so that, that's not brand new to, to COVID. You're so certainly. cool, Mark. You're, you're, hey. you're, you're a trendsetter. Like, everybody followed you. Like, <laughs> I didn't know how to pick my therapist. Oh, the head of the curve. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I love that it, the commonality of it is that much more and, and Skype sessions, or I'm sorry, Zoom sessions and uh, and then and then specific programs like BetterHelp and, and these different uh, sort of online tools. Certainly there's a business dynamic of it, uh, but the accessibility of therapy and, and the fact that it's, it's so much more accessible is, is wonderful. And obviously, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I love therapy. I'm, I, I have a therapist myself. It's something that Bottom line, we all should have some season of our life that we are involved in therapy, whether it's an ongoing situation or someone you can even have kind of in a general rotation. Now that I've been doing this for 15 years or so, it's fun to have touch points with clients who are like, hey, you know, we worked together five years ago. Can I come back in 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You did our premarital counseling. We now have a 12-year-old, you know, and can you see my 12-year-old? Oh my God. I mean, talking about like that, that kind of warm, like community, you know, caregiver in my heart, like yeah. it just makes me so happy. So I love that there's, there's an increased uh, availability to that. And so whether it's, it's some of the apps of BetterHelp, um, there's a, a basic site called Psychology Today that, that local therapists basically list their, their practice. Uh, what's great about the way the world is now is just look up somebody. And, and so, you know, um, uh, ironically, I was working with this couple in New York that just somehow found me online. I'm not sure how they found me. And um, there's this therapist that I love. You mentioned Brene Brown. There's a therapist named uh, Esther Perel. Do you know? Oh, Perel? obsessed. Come on. Obsessed with her podcast. Obsessed, Mark. She's, love her. I mean, she is something else. She is just a unicorn. Oh, oh. she's the charts. So, so then let me, let me go ahead and state my, my not so humble brag. So I'm working with this couple in, in Manhattan and, uh, and I pull this Esther quote and I say, well, Esther Perel, this therapist that I love to study says, blah, 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 blah. They go, oh, we know Esther. She was our therapist before you. 
I was like, drop the mic. I'm done. I'm done. Like, I mean, that alone, man, you were probably like levitating off your chair, like by an inch. Like, oh, honestly, yes. if if I if I had come after Esther Perel, like I'm just I would be like texting everybody. I was like, oh, yo, yeah. yo, <laughs> Jasmine, I am the bomb. Let me tell you right now. <laughs> that was such a subtle flex. And I am oh, so yeah. here for it. Mm. I am so here for it. Uh, I love it. OK, so my friends and I big advocates for therapy. We have to talk about uh, like our therapist. And then we also have gone through a a variety. Like, you know, you have different therapists at different points in your time and life. Mm -hmm. And as I, so just to be very clear for all listeners, the reason I brought Mark onto the podcast is because he is not my therapist at this point in time. However, uh, we worked together for years. I've recommended lots of friends, my family to Mark. And I'm just a huge proponent of who he is and what he does. And as I started looking for another therapist, the person I turned to was Mark. I trust Mark and Mark knows me. And I'm like, Mark, this is what I'm looking for in in a therapist. And one of the things, and I was very open with him. I was like, I'm looking for a female therapist because I'm at a different stage in my life as a mother and as a wife. And he was like, great. Sent me a few great recommendations. And I felt nervous because my friends and I call it therapy dating. Like you have to date a therapist and we have a notion. And I don't know if you co-sign disagree and please, please disagree. We think that in order to be fair to the relationship when you're looking for a therapist is you got to date them three times because the first time you just they're trying to get to know you and you're not trying to get to know them. Like before you make a decision about a therapist, it's like three times. What do you think? Okay, so. All right. So let me just pause, rewind it for a second and edit the former answer. Psychology Today, BetterHelp. I love that that means therapy is accessible to the masses. However. It is a small percentage of therapists that I would personally refer to. It is a small percentage of therapists that I would send my friends and family to. And the, the challenge with this field is, is kind of like physician heal thyself. People go into the field from their own woundedness. And so there are many, many therapists that, um, you know, I, obviously there's a competency level. There's a certain level of competency to become a licensed professional, but that I, I simply would not go to. So a trusted recommendation is is very, very high value. So someone who knows someone who worked with them, a friend of yours, a friend of a friend who works with you. So I do, and this is objectively, if you're able to have dialogue with some friends who have you worked with, have you guys ever seen a therapist? uh, There is a certain personality type of of therapist that, that you and your listeners would benefit from. So whether that's, uh, you know, high achieving therapists themselves or just high level of competency or intelligence or, or sort of a comfort level with working with certain pers- uh, personality types and, and professional sort of, uh, you know, prowess, do a little bit of homework on that yeah. first, which you might be able to find significant amounts through website, through articles. I've got a lot of stuff on YouTube. If, you know, somebody could do a quick, you know, Mark Howard and stuff. And, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. Not all good, but some good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but point being, uh, you know, do a little bit of homework, do a little bit of research, three sessions. I love that. God bless. But no, I don't know. I wouldn't see somebody for three times. I mean, therapy is expensive. I don't have, you know, you know, three times. So you what, you think it's like, you think it's like one day and you know, I think so here, here's how it works for me. I want a recommendation. Yes. Okay. So, so, so if, if your friend calls me, Hey, you know, Jasmine gave me your number. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm happy to do a 15 minute phone call. Let's do a talk. Let's just kind of hear oh. what you're, you're going at. The the notion very early on, I was like, Hey, I'll do a, you know, a pro bono session just to kind of get to know each other. Oh. I don't do that because we do therapy. We jump right in. I got stuff to do. You know, I'm seeing right. people who want to get stuff done. So, so an hour is a quantifiably yeah. successful, uh, you know, time spent. So, so, so no, I'm not going to do an hour, but I'll do a 15 minute consult with you because again, I don't want to just be a one-off consult. My hope is that we get in and do work, that mm. we spend a significant amount of time, whether that's, you know, you know, 10 sessions or two years or in some cases even longer. So sure, cool, 15 minutes. And I will tell you this, come on in. If during that first session, you're like, this guy's a quack, this is not a fit for me, We're, we came to the wrong place, hey, no problem, God bless, you know, let, let's find you somebody else. Mm-hmm. I get enough calls, I'm busy enough. There's enough good therapists. Don't waste your time. Abundance, baby. Abundance. So, yeah, I would be very direct. Like, like, what are the questions you have? Have you worked with entrepreneurs in the past? Do you oh, yeah, yeah, have- yeah, yeah. Questions. Questions that somebody should ask. Like, hey, they, they are able to secure a 15-minute, um, just kind of like 
talk with a potential therapist? What are some questions that we can ask to, to help entrepreneurs, people in general, know if this person's a fit for them? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you worked with business owners and entrepreneurs in the past? So when we say, what is your modality? That means what's your approach? So, so I am, I'm a cognitive behavioral humanistic existential psychologist, or that's my approach. So therefore, what are your thoughts and actions, cognitives and behaviors? And then humanistic is, I love humanistic psychology. Be the very best human you can be. That is the, the premise of humanistic psychology. Be the very best person that you can be in whatever category of life or in all the categories of life. And then existential is, we're all just freaking ants, ants in a hill. <laughs> mentioned to ants. I feel like I'm going to send you an ant farm as a thank you gift for coming on the podcast. <laughs> I want to see it in your office. <laughs> what is what is the point of all this? You know, whether again, it's your person of faith and you believe that God and heaven is your objective in life, or we're just, you know, you know, evolved monkeys who are sitting in, in clothes, whatever your paradigm is of our purpose of existence, that needs to be explored. And if your purpose of existence is just to acquire the highest you know, whatever, fill in the blank, the biggest anthill, the biggest amount of money, the biggest amount of power. Okay, cool. Then you're, then, then you're working on that. If you think there's a higher purpose of your existence, that's going to motivate your actions. So, mm -hmm. so people ask me, okay, what's your modality? If, you know, um, and frankly, I would say, what's your, what's your goal? Like, why are you coming to therapy? You know, so clearly state, here's what I'm looking for. The person that's calling me, there's something going on. Hey, my relationship is in the tank. Hey, I, I'm stuck in my, in my vocation. I'm wanting to make a change. I feel depressed. I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. I heard you on a podcast and I think we could do some tweaking in how I view myself and how I view my life. Okay, let's, let's dialogue. Here's how I would approach that. And frankly, Jasmine, there's times I, I get a hunch pretty quick of like, I'm not your person. I am not your person. And do you, do you, do you tell that person? You don't Heck yeah. I don't want to waste my time. Jasmine, I love my work. I love my work, okay? I mean, like this moment right now is an embodiment of why I do what I do. Amen. So, so, so my paradigm is I love influencing people who are influencing others. Mm. Whether that means it's that person I worked with who's going to go home and be kinder to his wife, be a little nicer to his kids, be a little better with his coworkers, then, then that person's going to be a little kinder to the next person, a little kinder to the next person, a little healthier to the next person. And so the work that I do, I call it, it's a transcendent benefit. Not that I'm the epicenter of it, but that investing in the action and that, that encounter of therapeutic growth will have literally a transcendent benefit on all the people they interact with and all the people that, that they interact with beyond that. So all the more I enjoy working with high achievers, business owners, influencers, leaders in their field, knowing that if this person has 10 employees, and if that person is a better human being by doing therapy with me, then those 10 employees mm -hmm. will benefit from that person's mm -hmm. self-discovery and betterment. And then all 10 of those families will be better. And all 10 of those kids will be better. And all 10 of those, you know, and then it literally just trickles out like a ripple effect to, to hundreds and, and, and you know, unlimited numbers. So that gives me existential purpose. Mm -hmm. So when I sit in here and I have a tough session with somebody, I'm thinking to myself, this is worth it. So much more worth the fee that I get at the end of the session. And sure, there's a fee to it, no doubt. But I am participating in existential, transcendent work that truly is making the world a better place. So when somebody calls me and they sound like a dip, I'm not interested. I'll say there's plenty of therapists on psychology today. There's plenty of people on better help you can go see elsewhere. And there might be some specific diagnosis that's not my specialty. There's certain certain populations that I would refer to someone else if they're if they're wanting to drill down on one particular diagnosis. But by and large, I want to see people that are wanting to take some steps forward. Mm. As we as we close this, one thing I want to be very, very, very clear with, clear with, clear on. If you think that working with a therapist is to solve or fix something, I think it's part of the equation. I think after you have done the work, you realize it's like when you're walking through a desert and you're okay, you're hot and your mouth is very dry and you're shuffling along and then somebody gives you a glass of water, you then realize how much more water would make the trip more enjoyable. And so I do want to put a, a juxtaposition that when I went to Mark, I was not in a good place it, it, for a myriad of things, mostly just stemming from things that had happened in my industry, in my job, in my life, my worth attached to the things that I was doing. And after working with Mark a few years, 
uh, my husband and I started the adoption journey. Now, we didn't know the adoption journey was going to be as long as it was. But at this point in time, I went to Mark not in need of something, right? I wasn't in a bad place. I was in a really good, hopeful, happy place that we were ready to start our family, albeit unconventionally, but it was where we were and we were so excited and it was something we desperately wanted. I was in a great place. I still reached out to Mark and Mark kindly came to my house. He did a house call because we'd be fancy out here in Orange County. Mm -hmm. Uh, He did a house call with my husband and I and Mark navigated sessions for us to prepare us for becoming parents. And some people listen to that and be like, girl, that is some, that is some luxury stuff. Listen, we have never been parents before. We had never adopted. We did not know the that different world. So talk about how beautiful. If you are in a good place and you're happy and fulfilled and you want to know how to navigate the next happy, wonderful, healthy patch, a therapist is just as good for that. Those conversations that we had with Mark profoundly changed the way that we showed up as parents. The energy that we embodied as a result of those conversations, I will never forget Mark was sitting across from my husband and I on a couch. And in the second hour, we kind of just like jotted down like a few notes. And then I sat across from my husband. There was a coffee table in the middle of us. And Mark had us, oh, I'm getting a little lump in my throat right now. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mark had us state our greatest fears about becoming a parent and what we thought and how we thought we would change. And hearing my husband talk about what he hoped for and what he wanted, and then me having to articulate my fear. I feared I wasn't going to be a good mom. I feared that things in the business were going to drop. And I feared that I would no longer be his partner, that we would be focused on something else. And it wasn't until I actually vocalized those fears that I realized that I then had the power to shift the narrative. And then Mark, very much like Mark, had said that our success as parents was a foregone conclusion but it was the greatest thing to approach therapy from two different forms with the same therapist, one from a place of need and want and one from a place of joy and abundance and preparation. So Mark, I don't think I ever thanked you for all the work. You are incredible. And the impact that you've had in my life, I just feel like now I've just changed entirely as a human. And so to have this conversation and look back and say, thank you for being the start of that journey. And I hope that this conversation is the start for other people's journeys, that they have the courage and the wherewithal and the desire to enhance their lives from a place of lack and want or joy and abundance and preparation. Mark Howerton, how can listeners just get in contact and follow more of all the good stuff that you're doing? First of all, why are you just making me cry on this thing, man? <laughs> oh, I love that. What what a, you know, I you know, get all excited about this transcendent exponential benefit <laughs> of the work that I do and then drilling it down directly to having a positive impact on you and your family. I Thank mean, you. Like, Thank you, Mark. What a joy. What an Thank honor. You. Thank you so much for letting me play that role in your life. Thank you. You are a sweet, sweet, amazing human being. And I want other people to still stay a part of your journey and just watch the goodness that you put out in the world. So where do they go? How do they stay connected to you after this podcast? Yes, yes, yes. I'm pretty easy. Mark Howerton is everywhere. So markhowerton.com, Mark Howerton on Instagram. Please jump on, say hello. Uh, would love to ask general questions. I do have a handful of, of podcasts and, uh, and different episodes on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, uh, wherever podcasts are found. There's some stuff out there with me if you wanted to just kind of do a little background before you reach out. But please, mm-hmm. would love to be in touch with, with your listeners and, and be a support directly or just in the peripheral any way that I can be. Oh, Mark, you are a godsend. You have had such an impact. The conversations we have had been divine, actional, pra- practitional, practical. I'm just making up words now because I'm just babbling. Because when I, when I hate when I hate when I let my guard down. I let my guard down. I got I had a little gangster tear. A gangster tear is like when you eyes water, but it doesn't fall. That's gangster. <laughs> I had a little gangster tear. Uh, Mark Harriton, it is always a joy. It is a pleasure. I actually... I have a feeling that the audience is going to want like part two of this. So I'm going to keep you on the spot and be like, if we do part two, will you come back? (laughs) You bet. You bet. I would love that. My Uh, pleasure. Maybe. maybe, Okay. This is going to be the CTA for today's episode, the call to action. If you have questions or if you would like to go deeper, like send, uh, send me a DM, like send us an email podcast at jasminestar.com. It would love to have another session that's drilling down around entrepreneurs questions in regards to therapy, psychology, betterment, mindset shifts, all that good stuff. Mark, Always pleasure, honor. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jasmine. So good seeing you. Thanks again. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Mark. If you did, please let us know at podcast at jasminestar.com or DM me at jasminestar and let me know if you would like a part two. That's podcast at jasminestar.com or I answer all of my DMs at Jasmine Star. Mark is so generous with his time and he is more than happy to come back to the show to answer your questions because I already asked him all of mine. I was very selfish, y'all. If you have questions, send up your follow-up questions to us. Podcast at jasminestar.com and we will bring him back on. Until then, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all. <laughs>